Yeah. Wonder what ever happened to baby Jesus. He, he grew up. What? Wait. So you're saying that the baby Jesus Christmas story is the same as the adult walk on water Jesus? Yeah. Thanks, honey. Wow, I just never really put the two concepts together. <laughs> Wonder what happened to that guy, huh? <laughs> he... he went to the cross. That's the same guy? Yeah. So what you're saying is baby Jesus is the same as cross Jesus? Yeah. I mean, there's some time in there, right? I mean, he... he grew up, he taught people, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and came back to life, and, you know, now he lives in our hearts. That's the same guy? The Jesus that lives in our hearts? <sighs> okay, I was really, oh, wow. Okay, I never really put all those guys together, you know? Only one guy. I tell you this. Here's an idea. Maybe we stop just making Christmas all just this once a year isolated thing, but we make it an ongoing story about the salvation in our hearts and lives. Up top. That's the idea. I thought today I'd, I'd just start with something funny um, and amusing, so just humor me a little. Um, there was a, a story about a man and who was married and they never had a disagreement. They never had an argument. And they'd been married for 50 years and they thought, I know, let's, let's find out how they managed to achieve this. So they asked the husband, they said, how do you manage never to have a disagreement with your husband, uh, with your wife? And he said, well, it all started on the day of the wedding. They were going to the reception and they had a horse and a, a carriage. And as they were going towards the reception, the horse suddenly stopped. And so she got out of the horse, walked to the front of it, looked at it in the eyes, and said, that's one. And then she got back into the carriage, and the horse trotted on, and then sure enough, they got, the horse stopped. So she got out of the carriage, walked up to the horse, and said, that's two. And then she got back into the, the carriage, and off they trotted again. And then a third time, the horse stopped. So she got out of the carriage, walked to the front, looked at the horse in the eyes, pulled out this gun, and shot the horse dead. And her husband said, you can't shoot a horse dead, darling. You just can't do that. And she looked at him, and she said, that's one. <laughs> Okay, let's open in prayer. Father, I thank you that we can be here. Father, open our hearts and our minds. Help us to make a real strong connection with you today and help us to put your word into action in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As that first little video clip said, it's so easy at Christmas to have a disconnect. You know, we get so tied up with the world and the way they celebrate Christmas. And I often say my classic saying that if you take Christ out of Christmas, you just get M&S. And it is so true that you lose that connection. And I want to look today at... Zechariah in the temple just before Jesus was born. In fact, six months before. And 
part of the, the temple was that the Levites were the only people that were allowed into the temple. And what they had done is they had allocated 24 divisions into the, of priests, divided them into 24, and each sort of group of priests would have two weeks duty to go into the temple. And during this time, they would burn incense on the altar of incense. And it was a tremendous honor in those days to be selected to do just that. And when the priests would go in to the temple, it's called the holy place, not the holy of holies, because only the high priests could go in there. But the priests would go in there, and everyone would be outside in the outer courts, praising and worshiping and praying to the Lord. And the interesting thing is, it was the priest that brought the prayers to the altar of incense, and it was the altar of incense that, that lifted up the prayers to the Father. So let's pick up the story in Luke 1.11. It said, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, where Zechariah saw him. He was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Now the first thing to see here is that his prayer was heard. God heard his prayer. The angel doesn't say he heard everyone's prayer. It was the priest's prayer that was heard. So many people can make requests to God, but only a priest can make a prayer that is heard by God. And a priest is always subject to the high priest. Just bear with me on this. You'll see where I'm going. You see, the normal people can't even get to the temple. They can only stay in the outer courts. They can't get into the holy, court, holy, the holy place inside. They're just not priests. But the good news is that when you come to Jesus, you all become priests. You all become priests. Priests and princesses, priestesses, and you also become prince and princesses because Jesus was a king. He was also a high priest. And Jesus is our high priest. 1 Timothy 2 5 to 6 says, For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and mankind. That man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. You see, for the priest's prayer to be answered, the high priest first had to go into the holy place and offer the blood sacrifice. Hence, Jesus is our high priest. His blood was offered so that we can go through Jesus straight to the Father. That means the Father will always hear your prayers. So you don't have to come to the pastor because it's not just the pastor's prayers that are heard. He will hear your prayers. Prayer changes things. Now, the difficulty with Zechariah and Elizabeth was they were happy. They were contented in life. But... There was one thing missing. They wanted a child. And for a woman not to be able to bear a child was almost a shame and a disgrace. And she loved the Lord, and they had prayed for a very, 
very long time. But the thing is, sometimes I call that the grit in life. It's the thing that you want that God doesn't give straight away that you push harder into God that causes those things to happen for his glory. It's a bit like a per, it's a bit like an oyster. When the grit gets into the oyster, it causes pain. But the oyster gradually works with the grit and turns it into a pearl, a beautiful pearl. And pearls, when they're fully formed and fully developed, have great worth. And at the right time, pearls are harvested and they become an object of beauty. If Elizabeth had not been barren, the glory of the Lord could never have manifested in her life. It was that glory that came in at the right time. The biggest problem is that people live messy lives. And this messiness can make people think that their prayers won't be heard. You might say, well, I've done this wrong. I've blown it here. God won't hear my prayers. But you see, Jesus came for the people with messy lives. That's the good news. And he hears your prayers. Messiness of life does not stop your prayers from being heard. In fact, it's that messiness of life that helps develop that connection with Jesus. So the more messy you get, the stronger that grit becomes, which pushes you into that connection with Jesus. God will hear your prayers. He is the restorer and the healer. Have a look at this video we're about to show, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, Mom, I think that's the last of the boxes out of the attic. Oh, here it is. Honey, you want to go get the kids so they can help me set this up? Do you want to go get the kids or do you want me to? Oh, yeah, sorry. You know, it's just funny to me that you want their help. What's funny about me wanting to make memories with my grandchildren? Okay, okay. What's funny is that you never let me help set up the nativity. You were always getting stuff all over baby Jesus. What? You were a messy child. You had messy hands. You got baby Jesus sticky. Once. I got baby Jesus messy one time. You remember that? Uh, remember it? You yelled at me and threw fruitcake at me. You got peanut butter all over the camel also, but I didn't discover that two years later. You threw fruitcake at me. I hate fruitcake. Hold on. Let me make sure I understand what's happening here, okay? You want to take what is a, a nightmare of a memory for me and turn it into something wonderful for my kids? Michael, I'm sorry if you were emotionally scarred. Emotionally scarred? I'm physically scarred. Do you know somebody else who has a fruitcake scar on their forehead? Just stop it. Mom, I was a kid. Kids get things messy. That's, that's life. The baby Jesus is a whole focal point of the nativity. Heck, he's the reason for the whole blooming season. And if you think for one minute you're going to touch him with your messy mess... Oh, all over? You've got another thought coming, mister. Jesus didn't come down here to get messy. That wasn't very good theology, was it? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I mean, Jesus said, you know, let the little children come to me, right? I mean... Apparently he was okay with getting messy. 
we're the ones that dress him up and yet he, he always came with the intention of getting his hands dirty. I guess I deserve the fruitcake thrown at me now, huh? <laughs> Grandma, may I please help decorate? Sure you can. Is that me, Jesus? Wait, wait, let's get you cleaned up first. Yes, that's baby Jesus. Go ahead, you can touch him. Michael, you want to give us a hand? Merry Christmas, Mom. Okay, okay, let's see what we've got. We've got um, a cow and a donkey and a sheep, but where's the shepherd? Right there. Right what? There. there he is, that's right. And where's Mary and Joseph? Right, right there. Right here, where should we put them? I like that video. It just shows uh, two people growing in their messiness by forgiving each other and moving on. The scar of the fruitcake will always remain, but now it becomes a symbol of their closeness rather than their distance. The new connection with each other was only made possible through Jesus. And Jesus living, not just on the outside, but inside. And he allows the whole family. You see, it doesn't just infect one person. It affects the whole family. And the whole family become united, full of love, full of grace. John's mission was described by the angel. Let me just read this, what he says in Luke 1, 16 to 17. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now catch this, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of righteousness, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You see, Jesus is the restorer. He's restoring families. He's bringing people back together. He's making those connections back into the heart. You see, hearts get cold and they become like ice. But when the Jesus comes, he melts the heart so we can have those connections with him and allow the love to flow and the unforgiveness to go into forgiveness. A pearl is produced every time there's a bit of grit that was painting an oyster Every time you suffer pain, there is a potential for that pain to be turned into a pearl, a pearl of great worth. Why? Because you have his joy, you have his peace, and you have his love living on the inside of you. Now, to make a pearl don't let that grit keep you in pain. Allow Jesus to help you turn that grit into something beautiful and wonderful. That closeness, that connection with each other. Now Zechariah faced with the good news that Elizabeth would become pregnant. And as it says in as I, as I read, and he will go on before the Lord in spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
What a wonderful thing to be told about your unborn child. I mean, if an angel stood and you were believing for a baby and said that to you, you would go, wow, just when I couldn't have a better word from the Lord to do, to do for my child to grow up and do all of those things would just be awesome. You know, Zechariah, great man of faith, really religious in the temple, worshipping, doing the incense. But listen to what he says, and we'll just see how much of a man of faith he really was. Zechariah asked the angel, and this is Luke 1.18, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. You see, the angel was sitting on the right side of the altar. He was sitting on the wrong side of the altar. He was standing in the wrong place, listening and looking at the circumstances. There's an angel here giving you a word from the Lord, and you're questioning, you're questioning what God says. An angel in front of you, and you have the audacity to question what God says? What is worse, he spoke out the circumstances. He trusted more in his own knowledge and his own understanding than what an angel of God was saying. And so many people live their life trusting in their circumstances and their own knowledge and not trusting in what God's Word says and speaking out what God's Word says as though it, is, although it has happened. That is faith in action. The angel allowed him grit in his mouth. He had to put some grit in his mouth. And that grit stopped him from speaking any more doubt and disbelief. The angel had to do st something to stop him. Otherwise, he would continue to speak out doubt and unbelief. You see, you can have whatever you say. But most people say what they have. And that is the problem. You look at the circumstances and you say what you have. Rather than look at the circumstances, look at the word and then say what God says about those circumstances. Mark eleven twenty four emphasizes this. Jesus said this, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. You've just got to believe that you've received it. All the angel wanted was a, a wow, or a amen, or thank you, Lord. He didn't want, my wife is old, it's too late, you should have come earlier. You should have let me win the lottery to go in the temple ten years ago, and then she could have got pregnant. But angel, you have blown it. That's what was going on. But all the angel wanted him to do was say, Amen. Just agree with God. It's so much easier to agree with God than it is to agree with the circumstances. The circumstances generate pain, suffering. God's word produces health, strength, wealth, relationships, peace, joy, love. But so often people say what they have rather than say what God says. You see, the contrasting story Pastor Sandra told of Mary, Mary agreed with the angel and said, let it be done according to your word. She trusted in the word over the circumstances. And it is so easy to look at the circumstances and respond to every circumstance without even praying.
You see, your prayers are heard. And you've got to believe, in spite of the messiness in our lives, God will always hear your prayer. You don't have to be holy than holy. There is only one person who was holy than holy, and that was Jesus. And that's what you're trusting in. You're trusting in your high priest, sacrifice in the holy of holies to be accepted. And it has been. And that's the good news of the gospel. We can now go through Jesus direct to God. And he will hear our prayers. And he will give us light about his word. And once we've got that light, we can speak it out. And we'll see it happen. We can either say what we have or say what he says. So this Christmas... Keep believing, keep trusting, and keep thanking God. Because if God said it, then you can thank him for it. Even though it hasn't manifested yet, it will do. It's just a matter of time. You take his promises, you speak them out over the circumstances, and sometimes, yes, they'll be opposite to the circumstances. Elizabeth was barren. But that barrenness was the grit. The grit caused her to push into God. And as she pushed into God, the glory of the Lord came in. And then that barrenness became God's glory and became her mess was then turned into her testimony of the glory of what God has done in her life. You see, when you make a connection with Jesus, Jesus comes to live in your heart. And that changes everything. He starts to connect everything together. You mean it's the same Jesus in the manger that is on the cross? The same one that lives in the heart? And it is. It's the same one that starts to change everything. It reverses the circumstances. And you will get to see his glory manifest in your life. And that is incredible. And all you have to do is keep agreeing with what God says over the circumstances. Don't curse yourself. Don't say I'm stupid. Don't say someone else is stupid. They're a child of God. Call them clever. Call them smart. Call those things that are not as though they were. Say what God says. And then you'll see what you say manifest. But I'm going to ask everyone here just to bow their heads and close their eyes. And this is an opportunity where you can connect with Jesus. You may have walked away for a while, but maybe it's time to come back and just this Christmas make that connection. Put Christ in front of m and I'm going to say a prayer, and I want you to pray it from your heart. And when you do, Jesus comes in. And it goes like this. Lord Jesus, I ask you into my heart. I believe you died for me. And on the third day, you rose again. And from this day forth, I will be with you in paradise. Now, if you said that for the first time, you have just been transformed from one kingdom to the kingdom of light. Everything that was against you is now turning and becoming for you. Things that were gritty are now being made into pearls. And Jesus will show you how. That is the good news. And when you pray, you're now a priest. And God will hear your prayers. Amen? Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. And if you've said that prayer for the first time, come and talk to me after the service. Because I'd like to welcome you into the kingdom. Amen? Let's have the worship team up.